speaker, Michael Frank, who's the Edgar L. Marston Professor of Cognitive Linguistic and Psychological Sciences at Brown University, um, who will be speaking about striatal dopamine computations in learning about agency. Take it away. All right. Thanks for uh, organizing this awesome meeting. I've really been enjoying it so far. And I'm going to just jump in. Um, we've all seen this slide already many times. Um, so but just to remind people about the notion that dopamine uh, is thought to convey something like a reward prediction error. Um, and the only thing I'll say about that here is that uh, the general idea is that dopamine neurons increase their activity when rewards are better than expected and they decrease activity when rewards are less than expected. Uh, but moreover, that that signal is thought to act to help solve the what's called the temporal credit assignment problem, that is trying to predict events that happened earlier in time that are predictive of future reward. And uh, as Yael mentioned yesterday, this has been a super useful theory that has accounted for a huge amount of data. And it's also been extended to uh, account for um, how this algorithm can uh, be applied to learning about which actions to select, how to optimize behavior. Uh, and uh, uh, I and many other people have worked on sort of more detailed neural network models of how the dopamine system can modulate activity in spiny neurons in the striatum to support reinforcement learning of some sort. Um, but it raises a question not only about how do you credit uh, events that happen earlier in time, but how do you credit uh, neurons that generated the ac actions that produce good outcomes or even, as I'll mention in a minute, not just neurons, but like which circuits, which parts of the striatum are most responsible. Um, and so we've already heard a lot about um, going beyond just the notion that dopamine is a scalar reward prediction error signal. Um, so we've heard that there's dynamics beyond reward prediction errors like ramping and maybe state prediction errors. Uh, we've heard from Josh Burke that there's dopamine in the target regions like in the striatum can be de decoupled from dopamine that's happening at the cell body, which suggests a lot more rich uh, dynamics of the dopamine system. Uh, and also we've heard from a, a few people, including Josh Dud Dudman, that there's a role for dopamine in movement and motivation that may be separate from uh, value learning per se. And so, uh, you know, the field is trying to grapple with all these questions and how to uh, better account for them. And what I'm gonna focus on today is that this notion of a scalar reward prediction error, that is a single number that goes up or down for every dopamine neuron, um, is not only uh, you know, not insufficient to account for a lot of data, it's also at the computational level, it's impoverished for assigning credit to the causal circuits that an animal might be using to engage in behavior. So uh, although uh, our neural models and others have suggested that you need dopamine in conjunction with things like glutamate and, and neural activity to, to credit the neurons that are responsible, um, that is not sufficient. So there's a lot of neurons that are active all the time when animals are engaging in motivated behavior, and we need to have some way of uh, trying to reinforce the right ones. For example, if you're selecting a high level plan uh, to pursue, pursue rewards of some sort, um, or uh, using some low level motor implementation to get there, it, there may be different amounts of credit that are due to those different levels of analysis. Um, and what I'm gonna focus on especially today is uh, a, a kind of simpler dichotomy, which is if you achieve a good outcome as an animal, uh, are those due to your own actions or due to external causes? And so to motivate that a little bit, here's a picture of two kids having fun going down uh, sledding and on a, um, in the snow. Uh, and they're having a lot of fun along the way and they're getting some prediction errors presumably. And they may be moving around and stuff, but they're not really responsible for that uh, fun. So they may develop some kind of habit and so, and so forth, but they're not really uh, agent in some sense. Uh, on the bottom is a picture of this mogul skier who has to sort of deliberately plan each action very rapidly. And every time they move, if they're producing actions that are congruent with uh, what would achieve good performance, they're going to get little reward prediction errors and they should really assign uh, themselves credit for that high level action. And those are sort of two different situations. And if you don't like the mogul example, uh, you can also think about it from uh, a music perspective. You may enjoy listening to music, um, but if you're playing guitar, you also have to figure out you know, which uh, frets and strings to play. And every time there's an outcome, you, you get some information about whether you're actually causing the good or bad sound. 
Um, and so if you think about this from the stridal circuit level here, just uh, as a cartoon diagram of two different uh, corticostriatal circuits motivated from uh, primate divisions between caudate and putamen, but this is rather abstract. You have, may have a, a sort of a motor circuit on the right and a more high level uh, plan circuit on the left. Um, and the problem is that if you have a scalar reward prediction error, dopamine innervates all levels of this corticostriatal hierarchy. And if one of those circuits is actually more responsible for an outcome than another, uh, there's no way for this to really differentially reinforce that. Um, and if you try to sort of apply what you learned about uh, how much fun it was to sledding to infer that maybe you're just going to have fun in the snow in general and that you'll, you'll be able to ski moguls that might lead to this sort of catastrophic uh, failure. Um, and so uh, in neural network models of this circuit, we have seen uh, back when I, I worked with Randy O'Reilly that if you have a mechanism that uh, is able to reinforce the causal circuit and not just the, causal, the neurons that are active, uh, but you have a mechanism that sort of detects, did that region of the basal ganglia influence the cortical state? Did you sort of change the action in some way? Uh, and then if that's true, that that should preferentially amplify dopamine to the, that circuit and maybe less so to other circuits. And so that was an idea. If you put that in neural network models, it really helps uh, performance in more uh, complex tasks. Um, but is there evidence for it? I mean, there is uh, some potential circuit ways in which this can happen. Um, but as we heard from Josh Burke yesterday, there's also now a lot of data that suggests that dopamine can be regulated locally at the terminals of the striatum. And so perhaps maybe one way of solving this credit assignment problem isn't necessarily by regulating uh, activity at the cell body, but maybe locally. Um, so an overview of what I'm going to uh, cover today is that instead of thinking about these reward prediction errors in a scalar way, we can try to uh, explain or um, try to uh, study whether there are vector-like signals. So, and I will claim that um, the results are actually much more interesting than we had thought in, uh, in terms of how that credit is, is assigned, and that there are these interesting spatial temporal dynamics of striatal dopamine terminals which provides information about whether an animal is agentic, whether they are actually producing rewards. Uh, and I will say that this sort of is manifest by regionally specific dopamine transients that convey something that looks like uh, agency prediction errors. And I'll be a little bit more clear about that near the end of the talk. Uh, but moreover, that there are these waves that traverse across the medial la lateral axis of the dorsal striatum that we think are actually used to differentially reinforce behavior. And I'll try to very briefly introduce this uh, computational model that we call a mixture of striatal expert model uh, that is uh, proposing how the system can infer agency and control its own local dopamine and how dopamine waves can reinforce striatal subregions to adapt behavior. Okay, with that, um, the method that we're using here is in the rodent, uh, and this is uh, all Arif Hamid's work. Um, and Arif will be available on uh, the Slack channel to answer all of the difficult questions, uh, especially about the methodological issues here. But the approach is he is going to be imaging uh, dopamine axons in the mouse striatum. Uh, he has some mice that are DAT pre mice where GCAMP is injected in the midbrain and he can image the terminals of dopamine uh, and other mice in which uh, he's expressed delight and he could uh, image dopamine release. Uh, he, to do that, he resected part of the cortex and puts in an uh, imaging cannula, and this is sort of a top-down view of the striatal area that he'll be imaging, uh, and, and there it is as well. Uh, and that way he gets to sort of image a lot of the striatal dopamine terminals that cover roughly 80% of the dorsal striatum. Um, so of course, we don't ask uh, mice to be mogul skiers, and what Arif did instead is he put mice on a wheel while imaging, uh, and he had it such that the mouse could run. And in one version of the task, um, the mouse does have to run in order to move these sort of tones that escalate in frequency. And there's also uh, sort of visual information that discreetly changes with time. Um, but in some uh, trials, the mouse has to run, let's say, five centimeters to move each tone. And then eventually, at the end of the 10th tone, they will get reward. Whereas in other trials, they might have to move, let's say, eight centimeters for each tone. And so what Arif actually does is he samples the amount that the animal has to run from a uniform distribution so that there's uh, a lot of ambiguity about what sort of task condition they're in in any one trial. And importantly, uh, that's the instrumental version of the task. There's also a Pavlovian version of the task 
where instead of the mouse having to run, they don't actually have to run at all, although they can if they want. Uh, but everything else is the same. It's just that the time to uh, changes between each tone is also sampled from a, a, a uniform distribution, um, but it just happens irrespective of the animal's actions. So in one case, the animal has to work to produce reward. In the other case, it doesn't. Um, and I, while I don't have time to, to go into it, you'll just have to trust me that the mice uh, show evidence in their behavior that they're actually using this discrete tone and visual information to update their judgment of the progress to reward. And you can see that in, in their licking behavior and other measurements. Uh, and so the question that we want to ask here, is there a subregion of the dorsal of the dorsal striatum and the most we're going to focus on the dorsal medial striatum, uh, which is thought to be involved in representing goal directed behaviors and action outcome contingencies, which is one way of thinking about agency. Um, and so the question is, does the dorsal striatum actually respond to um, does it detect when the animal's actions are responsible for attaining rewards? So if the actions affect the world, that's an instrumental task, and presumably the dorsal medial striatum should get more in reinforcement, whereas if it's a more Pavlovian task, maybe less so, and maybe the animal will still run in some cases. Uh, and so uh, the main interesting finding here is that in the instrumental task, if I just pr uh, play a movie of the terminals, the G-camp terminals in this case in the instrumental task at the reward, uh, what you can see is that there's a big burst of dopamine, but if you play it again you can and look at it carefully, you see that that burst of dopamine across the dorsal striatum uh, acts like a wave that goes from the medial striatum towards the lateral striatum. So there is sort of some global like signal that all the terminals seem to get active, but they're not all getting active at the same time. Uh, and interestingly, if you look in the Pavlovian task, uh, you also see a wave of, like, of activity, but it actually starts in the lateral striatum and propagates to the medial striatum. Um, and Arif has used uh, optical flow methods to sort of quantify this wave trajectory. Uh, and what I'm showing here is uh, sort of vector fields that show the average um, direction of travel across the striatum. And in the instrumental task, on average, the direction goes from uh, the medial striatum towards the lateral striatum whereas in the Pavlovian task, it's the opposite. Um, and uh, if you look at what happens in naive animals, uh, they do have spatial temporal dynamics at reward, um, but the waves are irregular and not structured. So the summary from uh, these studies is that this sort of spatial temporal trajectory of dopamine signal is learned uh, because it's not there in naive animals. Uh, but moreover, it's sensitive to task structure. It depends on whether the animal is responsible for the outcomes. Uh, and that might provide some way of assigning uh, vector-like reward prediction errors. And I'll try to unpack that a bit. Uh, and we think it can be used for credit assignment. A um, uh, preliminary version of this paper was put on BioArchive, so you, I encourage you to check it, check it out if you want to look at a lot more details about characterizing the waves and so forth. Uh, although we'll be updating that soon with new data that I'm about to present, some of which uh, right now. Um, so all of that was uh, animals that had been in some sessions in the Pavlovian task and some sessions in the instrumental task. Uh, so what Arif has done now is to actually do task reversals where sometimes the animal is responsible for the outcomes and sometimes not. Uh, and what you can see in panel B here is that when the animal was in the instrumental task, it was running. And then when it switches to the Pavlovian task, it sort of learns I don't need to run as much and, and progressively stops running and uh, vice versa when it was in the uh, Pavlovian task and it learns that it's in the instrumental task, it starts running. So it learns to adapt its behavior according to the, the task statistics to get its reward. Uh, and so now we can also ask, are there differences in the, in the dopamine dynamics here? And in this case, Arif has also used DLight as well as GCAM. Um, and so I'm just gonna play the video of what happens when the animal gets uh, reward in both of these task sessions, in both of these tasks. Um, and I'll play it first for D-Light and then GCAM. And on the left will be the Pavlovian trials and the right in the instrumental trials. Uh, and if you watch that video in slow, you can see that there's also waves in the D-Light signal that go in opposite directions, just like we saw in the last uh, slide. And again, the same thing for the GCAM signal. And that's on average. Um, uh, you can sort of quantify that and show that the wave angle goes up towards from the medial to the lateral striatum in instrumental trials, uh, more than the Pavlovian trials in both D-Light and G-CAMP sessions. Uh, and moreover, you can look at the dynamics of this. So this is an example of the vector field for an animal on one trial, right when the reward happens. And you can see when the animal is in pink in the Pavlovian task, 
the vector is guided from uh, the lateral striatum towards the medial striatum. Uh, and then here's the block change. And you can see in the first trial of the block change in this particular instance, the wave is still going from lateral to medial and then still sort of going from lateral to medial. But then after a couple of trials, it reverses and the wave goes in the other direction. And here, uh, Arif has quantified that across animals and sessions. And you can see there's a really nice uh, reversal of the wave uh, angle as the animal goes from instrumental to Pavlovian and vice versa. So uh, that all suggests that uh, the wave uh, propagation changes according to the task demands. And we, we are claiming that that might be involved in, in credit assignment. But how can we test that? Uh, and so to formalize this a little bit more, we went to this uh, computational model that we call the mixture of striatal behavior, uh, sorry, mixture of striatal experts, uh, which is based on some of the sort of other neural network and higher level computational models that we've applied in uh, explaining primate and human behavior, uh, but here applied to the dopamine system and to a reef's test. Uh, and the basic idea is just that if you're trying, if you're a mouse in this task, you may want to keep track of the different kinds of contingencies. Am I in the distance task? So you may have a distance sort of expert that keeps track of the evidence for being in that task. And you might have a time expert that just says, well, all I have to do is wait. But within each of those, you have to uh, attend to the possibility that sometimes you have to run something like three centimeters per tone and sometimes five centimeters per tone and so forth. And so those we call uh, sub experts. Uh, and at the end of the day, the model has to decide, well, should I run or not, and how fast? Uh, and in this model, the question is, how do you assign credit to whether you're in the distance task or the time task? Uh, and the basic idea is that the model accumulates evidence for the experts and the sub-experts that best predict the tone transitions. So uh, at, if you're moving and the tone changes in, co in congruence with your movements, that gives you some evidence that pretend that you're actually causing the outcomes. So agency, one way of uh, sort of representing agency here is congruency between the actions and the outcomes. Um, and so if you're in a task where the, the tones are, are transitioning really quickly or really slowly, um, the, the sub-experts here each have their own reward prediction error. Uh, and this would be in a, in a short trial, what you can see is that there would be a, a reward prediction error at each of these tone transitions that grows a little bit with time because of the nature of the temporal difference uh, algorithm. Um, and if you're in a long trial, there's also these prediction errors, but they just happen uh, long, uh, you know, when the, the tones uh, arrive. Um, and so those prediction errors can be used to, to derive some inference about which of these sub-experts are best predicting the outcome. So the ones that are having the least prediction errors would be the ones that are sort of most likely to be responsible for uh, the task. Uh, and in this model, those can be sort of accumulated to provide evidence that perhaps the animal is now in this sort of eight centimeter per tone condition and not in one of the other conditions. Uh, and at the highest level, uh, this model predicts that there's sort of the distance expert will get evidence that, okay, now I'm agentic if I'm in the distance task and there'll be sort of a ramp in the evidence for whether the uh, animal or the model is in control or a negative ramp when it's not in control, when it, it's not uh, agentic. Um, and so if there is uh, that evidence across the trial that the animal is in control, um, then that can be used to decide how much the model should run. Uh, and that would uh, generate a wave. And I'll try to unpack a little bit later if I have time, how that might happen and how, my, how it's implemented in the model. Um, but suffice to say that uh, that wave can actually reinforce the, the expert that was most uh, deemed most responsible for the task, and then the model will decide to sort of run more and more in the instrumental task and less and less in the Pavlovian task. Uh, so uh, I know that was quick and a lot, so I'll just remind you of the, the basic uh, predictions here are that there'll be uh, prediction errors at the lowest level uh, within these sort of sub-experts um, that are aligned once you uh, plot it in terms of percent complete. Um, and we'll call those sort of agency prediction errors, uh, that they should be sort of distance dependent uh, ramps. Uh, and moreover, that there'll be uh, waves that propagate in one direction to uh, support the um, medial striatum and the other direction to support, uh, to less support the medial striatum if the animal is not agentic. Um, and so in this model, these prediction errors are used to make inferences about agency, which are then used to guide the wave.
And then the wave is used for credit assignment to then affect learning. Okay, so what Arif did is look for evidence for something like this mixture of experts architecture in the striatal system by imaging at both 1P and 2P levels. Um, and at the 2P level, he could look at, at specific parts of axon segments, and he found these really interesting um, transients that happen uh, at each of the individual tones. And so rather than having just one part of the, the system respond to all of these prediction errors, uh, what he found is that there are actually sub segments of axons that respond with transients only to the first tone transition and not really much to the other ones. And there are other axon segments that respond to the second one, the third one, and sort of tiles the whole space. So this is sort of one notion that's a little bit reminiscent of a vector prediction error, but not at the circuit level, but really at the, uh, the level that sort of Yale referred to earlier and a little bit related to, I think, what Nathaniel Dahl will talk about later. Um, Interestingly, when you sort of zoom out and just look at the, the 1P level, uh, what you do see is that there are these ramping-like signals. Uh, and I'm not really gonna spend a lot of time on that because I don't have a lot of time today. I wanna focus on the wave and the credit assignment problem. Um, but moreover, uh, we can look at, again, we've seen already that the animal does run more in instrumental session and it runs- uh, Two minutes, to Michael. Run. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, it runs more in instrumental session and it learns to not run in the Pavlovian session. And so uh, the question that we wanted to ask here is, according to this model, this uh, wave provides a mechanism for credit assignment. And that predicts that the amount to which the wave goes from the medial striatum, or sorry, yeah, from the medial striatum to the lateral striatum should actually reinforce instrumental behavior. And so to test that, uh, Arif did a regression that looked at uh, how much does the angle of the wave on the last trial affect velocity on the next trial. And what he found was that there was a significant uh, regression coefficient that if the wave went uh, a lot from the medial striatum to, to the lateral striatum on the last trial, the animal is likely to run more late into the next trial. And that effect was also seen uh, two trials back in a way that looks a lot like reinforcement learning uh, algorithms and then it sort of goes away as you go three and four trials back. So this is uh, correlative, but some suggestion that uh, this wave might be involved in credit assignment for running. Okay, the last part that I wanted to illustrate here is uh, from a computational perspective, you may be wondering why is the wave involved in credit assignment at all? And so I'm just gonna try to uh, unpack, unpack the ideas here. Uh, so some of the theories from basic reinforcement learning, and this is from the, the classic Sutton and Bartow book, suggest that if you get a reward prediction error at a particular point, state t plus one, um, that should reinforce not only the state that arrived immediately before it, but perhaps there are, might have been states that happened earlier in time that um, might have been responsible for that reward prediction error without having to wait for everything to back propagate across many uh, trials of learning. And because, you know, a lot of times rewards are, are delayed in time. And so you might want to consider that stuff that happened long ago uh, might have some chance of being causally responsible for the reward, but you want to sort of not do that quite as much. And so there's this notion of eligibility traces that the effect of the reward prediction error goes uh, down as you go further back in time. Uh, and there's also evidence for this in the mouse striatum from both uh, the Wickens lab and from the Kasai group that as you wait longer in time for dopamine to arrive, uh, it has lesser and lesser effect on reinforcing striatal synapses. Uh, and so how can the wave support structural credit assignment? Well, if you plot, you just draw these little ROIs as Arif has here, uh, and you plot, um, you look at the wave in a different way, you can see that essentially the peak of the dopamine response is delayed in the different subregions depending on the task condition um, in a way that should lead to different amount of credit according to this eligibility trace idea. Uh, to, so to simulate that, um, what I'm, showing here is going to be a standard temporal difference algorithm with eligibility traces and using these sort of semi-Markov uh, states, but everything else is sort of vanilla. Um, and what I'm going to plot is how the reward prediction error back propagates from the reward to earlier to the first tone as the model is going through the same task that the animal did. Um, but rather than just plotting one uh, trajectory of this temporal difference algorithm, I'm going to align what I'll call the different uh, experts that span the space from medial to lateral striatum. So on the left would be the most medial uh, area and on the, on the right would be the most lateral. And 
for this purpose, I'm just going to induce a wave by just giving uh, a reward prediction error at, time, at zero delay for the most medial area and at one delay, one time step delay here and another time step delay there. And when I press play here, it's going to show how this reward prediction error will backpropagate to the earliest uh, predictor, as you see in general uh, temporal difference algorithms, uh, with uh, eligibility traces in play. And you can see that as the model is learning, the reward prediction error is backpropagating for all these sort of uh, medial to lateral segments of the model. But in the area that receives the reward the quickest, that had the shortest delay, in this case, simulating the instrumental task where the medial stratum is the source of the wave, uh, has the largest reward prediction error at the end of learning here to the first tone, and it gets the most amount of credit. And so you can see that if you just uh, also plot uh, the value function that arises here, uh, and uh, as we've seen from uh, Josh Burke's talk, the value function goes up from the earliest time point to the latest time point. Um, and you can see that as a result of this delay due to the wave, the credit is getting assigned to the most medial stratum that sort of predicts the most amount of value. And, and um, that goes down in a graded way to the lateral stratum. So this is just in, in principle, a way in which the wave might actually solve this credit assignment problem. Uh, and I also just wanted to highlight that uh, this is related a little bit to David Kleinfeld's talk where he said that dopamine can act as its own eligibility trace because uh, the model that I mentioned before suggested that um, the value function is something that the animal and the model has to itself infer. Like, am I being agentic? Do I get a ramp? Is there, am I in control of the task? And then that should actually guide the wave in the direction to reinforce behavior which then can reciprocally influ influence these value ranks. Uh, that was a mouthful in just a few uh, minutes, but the summary here is that Arif sees these novel uh, waves that span the dorsal striatum, uh, and the waves are sensitive to task structure in a way that we think is consistent with this sort of mixture of experts, uh, and in principle, and with some evidence, it can support credit assignment via eligibility traces, uh, he also sees ramps in motivated behavior with a, and we have a, a somewhat different interpretation of the role of these ramps, although I'll note that this is the dorsal striatum and not the midbrain or the ventral striatum. Um, but we think that the ramps are involved in inference about agency and for guiding uh, performance uh, and that they're actually informed by these agency prediction errors, those transients that I uh, very quickly went into. And of course, there's a huge amount of open questions here about the mechanisms and, and uh, many other things. So I'll look forward to your questions. Uh, and uh, I and Arif will be available in the Slack channel to answer many of those as well as right now. So thank you, especially to Arif who did all of this work and to Chris Moore, who's a co-mentor of Arif and whose lab he sits in. It's my lab and the funders and my other collaborators. So thank you. Thanks, Michael. I think we have time for one question, and then the rest will have to be on Slack. Um, so, Alexa. Sorry for going over time. <laughs> That's all right. We have one question that seems to be particularly popular, so I will take our time to ask that one question. Um, Marios Panayi wants to know, if the instrumental response is uh, running on a wheel and the Pavlovian task is done on that same running wheel, is it possible that this Pavlovian task is actually just the animal learning to inhibit the instrumental response? So more of a go, no go rather than Pavlovian versus instrumental? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, this notion of Pavlovian conditioning is, is an excellent paradigm from psychology, but it's also a little bit, um, you know, in the, in the real world, it's very rare that an animal would get a, a, some stimulus that just shows up that will always predict that it'll get reward. And so in, in my view, um, what the system is trying to figure out is which parts of the brain are responsible for outcomes. And so the Pavlovian task, we don't think necessarily as a Pavlovian task per se, it's, it's essentially learning, do I need to run or not? Sometimes the animals just like to run anyway. Uh, I'm not sure it's go, no go per se. It's not really discrete because the animal changes its velocity in lots of different interesting ways. And it's really an optimization problem of does it feel like running and how fast should it run and what's the rate of reward that it could achieve from, from running? And that's what it seems to be adapting in ways that are consistent with this uh, credit assignment problem. Um, 